Hi, everyone. This is Olivia Kirkland with the Lucille Packard Foundation for Children's Health. I'd like to thank you all for joining us for today's webinar, Childhood Adversity Data to Help Advocate for Change. Today's webinar is co-sponsored by the Lucille Packard Foundation for Children's Health and the California Department of Public Health. I'll go ahead and get us started by introducing today's panelists. Marissa Abbott is a California Epidemiologic Investigation Service Fellow at the California Department of Public Health. Placed at the Safe and Active Communities Branch, she primarily supports the CDC-funded California Essentials for Childhood Initiative, a childhood maltreatment prevention project, which will be addressed in more detail later on during her presentation. Our second panelist, Lori Turk, is substituting for our originally scheduled panelist, Nathan Porter, who was called in for jury duty. But of course, we are more than pleased to have Lori represent the foundation on his behalf. Lori has extensive experience with project management, data collection, analysis, and reporting for social welfare and education research projects and has a particular interest in examining and diminishing disparities. In her role as Senior Manager of Deep Data and Research at the Lucille Packard Foundation for Children's Health, Lori ensures the quality, relevance, and utility of the research and content on kidsdata.org, a comprehensive data source which she will be introducing in detail later on during today's webinar. Now for a few housekeeping notes before I pass it along to Marissa. We ask that all attendees please enter questions into our GoToWebinar chat box. There will be time at the end of the webinar for our panelists to address any of the questions submitted. All attendees will be muted for the duration of the webinar, and the webinar recording and slides will be made available on kidsdata.org, and all registrants will be notified when those materials come become available. Now, I will go ahead and pass it along to Marissa. He will go ahead and get us started with the agenda. Marissa? Great. Thank you so much for the wonderful introduction. Um, and so before we begin, I just wanted to go through kind of what we're going to talk about today on the webinar. And the agenda includes describing the burden of child adversity and talking about the data that we have available that can help you make that argument. And then we'll continue on to talk about how you can engage and mobilize your community and frame your message around the child adversity and resilience piece. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Oh, thank you. Um, and so before I move any forward, I just wanted to acknowledge that this webinar is supported by a grant from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention and is also supported by the Lucille Packard Foundation for Children's Health. Next slide, please. I also wanted to start by giving some background on the California Essentials for Childhood Initiative, which is the project that I support at the Department of Public Health. And it is a collective impact project that led to our partnership with the Lucille Packard Foundation for Children's Health, specifically with the Kids Data Team. And it really serves as the basis for our work and interest in addressing child adversity. So Essentials for Childhood is a CDC-funded child maltreatment prevention project that uses the social determinants of health framework. And for those of you that may not be familiar, social determinants of health refer to anything and everything in one's political, economic, and social environment that impacts their health and well-being. The Essentials Project is a partnership between the California Department of Public Health Safe and Active Communities Branch and the California Department of Social Services Office of Child Abuse Prevention. And we work with several partners and initiatives in the community, including First Five California, ACES Connection, the Center for Youth Wellness, the Department of Justice, and the Lucille Packard Foundation, among others. Next slide, please. And the CDC has four goals for the Essentials Initiative that we use to kind of structure our work around. And they are to raise awareness and commitment to promote safe, stable, nurturing relationships and environments to prevent child maltreatment to use data and best practices to inform solutions, to create the context for healthy children and families through social norms, system change, and program improvement, and to create the context for healthy children and families through policy. 
So as you can see, we're focusing on a lot of different facets of child maltreatment, including the data and the programs, policies, and social norms piece. Next slide, please. So you might be wondering, you know, why focus on child diversity? And, and there's a lot of different reasons to focus on child diversity. Um, so child diversity, such as things like child abuse, um, family alcohol and substance abuse, exposure to violence, or poverty has a negative long-term impact on, on the health and well-being of our population. And the early experiences that we have, both positive and negative, affect our brain architecture, which provides the foundation for future learning, emotional development, behavior, and health. And the toxic stress that gets under your skin and is associated with these negative experiences can disrupt healthy development and lead to serious health issues in adulthood, such as chronic diseases, obesity, and substance abuse. And so I think one of the great things about child adversity or adverse childhood experiences, or ACEs, as some of you may be more familiar with that term, is that ACEs provide a frame that makes trauma into an intersectional issue. So essentially, the way that our world is set up, in some ways, is it's very sector-oriented. So for example, you might work in child welfare. I work in public health. Someone else might work in education, but all of the issues that we're talking about are interrelated, and so we really should be talking to each other about these ACEs trauma issues. And for that reason, I think that ACEs matter to everyone at the community and the organization level and serve as a great tool for bringing together different partners and perspectives to the table. And so the last piece that I do want to mention before I move on to the next slide kind of focuses on resiliency. And resiliency is an adaptive response to hardship that can mitigate the effects of these adverse childhood experiences. Um, it includes a combination of internal and external factors, and it is created and strengthened by safe, stable, nurturing relationships and environments within and outside the family. And so I should note that we are very interested in resilience and resilience-based solutions as a way to address adversity in moving forward. Next slide, please. And so, as I mentioned, child adversity really includes a wide range of traumas that affect children and families, from child maltreatment to exposure to violence and food insecurity. And there is a growing body of scientific literature that communicates the science of ACEs. So essentially, the research that focuses on the consequences of adverse childhood experiences and how ACEs get under our skin. And I want to backtrack for one second and just talk about this original conceptual notion of ACEs and kind of where we've moved from there with the science and development. And the original conceptual notion of ACEs was created through the CDC Kaiser Permanente ACE study and subsequent surveys that focused on several indicators of household and family dysfunction, including clinical child abuse and neglect. And essentially, the study showed that ACEs are common and that they co-occur which if you think about it makes a lot of sense because traumas are cumulative. But there are also several other pieces of ACEs science that I want to talk about that are important when you're articulating you know, why child adversity and resilience matter. And those pieces include the neurobiology of toxic stress or the brain science, the health consequences of ACEs, so how that toxic stress impacts our body system, and then also the historical and generational trauma, or the epigenetic consequences of that toxic and continuous stress that's associated with these traumatic experiences. Or essentially, how do ACEs alter the expression of our DNA? So all of this, you know, these different facets of research have led to a growing awareness about the issue and aligns with many different sectors of work, particularly for those who work with children and families but also you know, has implications at the community, organizational, and population level. Next slide, please. And so you know, due to our interest in, in the growing scientific literature surrounding ACEs, the Essentials Initiative partnered with kidsdata.org to add three different sources of adverse childhood experiences data onto their website, creating the new data topic, Childhood Adversity and Resilience. 
And I do want to mention, you know, why we chose to call it Child Adversity and Resilience versus ACEs. And the reason for that is because with these three data sources, we wanted to expand beyond the traditional notion of ACEs that focused on household and family dysfunction to present a broader social determinants perspective of adversity across the lifespan. So essentially, each data source has a different purpose, but when you put them together, it provides a comprehensive framework for understanding and addressing child adversity. And, and furthermore, the three data sources, they, they get at this intergenerational component of ACEs and provide a broader perspective that looks at these societal, social determinant level causes of trauma and really reiterates this prevent, stop, mitigate, and recover notion that is central to developing resilience-based solutions to adversity. And so Lori will talk a little bit more about these three data sources in detail in a minute, and we'll kind of walk through the data on kids' data. I just wanted to start by providing some background on our work and, and the frame for, you know, why focusing on child adversity. Thank you, Marissa. Yes. Our vision at Kids Data is for all children to reach their maximum health potential. Kids Data is a part of the Lucille Packard Foundation for Children's Health. The foundation supports the Lucille Packard Children's Hospital at Stanford, promotes an improved system of care for children with special health care needs, and it makes kidsdata.org possible. Kids Data is a resource that provides over 600 indicators about children's health and wellness, many of which are related to understanding more about children's adverse experiences. It is used by policymakers, program directors, and other decision makers throughout California for assessing community needs, setting priorities, tracking progress, preparing grant proposals, and making program and policy decisions. We particularly focus on making data actionable so that you can quickly get the data that you need to support your work in children's health and wellness. Next slide, please. We have data on kidsdata.org that are explicitly about children's adverse experiences from three sources, as Marissa mentioned earlier. And together, as Marissa mentioned, uh, they provide a comprehensive framework for understanding child, childhood adversity across the lifespan. We have data from the National Survey of Children's Health or NSCH data, which focuses on family, economic, and community measures from the perspective of parents reporting on their child's experiences. We also have data on the Maternal and Infant Health Assessment, or MIHA data, which also focuses on family, economic, and community measures, although they differ slightly from the NSCH measures. These data are from the perspective of the postpartum mothers reporting on their own childhood experiences. And third, we have data from the Behavioral Risk Factor Surveillance System, or BRFIS data, which focuses on family measures from the perspective of adults reflecting on their own childhood experiences. Next slide, please. I will show you how to find the data that you, that you need for a particular message in a minute, but first I'm sharing a few examples of what you can do for the data uh, with the data from our site. With a few clicks, you can get pie charts, maps, bar charts, trend lines, or tables, and you can use these graphics to visualize information that is most important to you and the people that you want to influence. For example, at a glance, your message can get across about where Cal in California children are facing greater adversity by looking at the darker shaded areas on the map or the longer bars uh, on the bar chart compared to California overall. Now I'm going to switch over to the website, and on the website, my focus is going to be on showing you, uh, showing you how to find the data that you want rather than sharing data findings, and you can go back later to explore and download the data that you are most interested in. So we'll switch over here. Okay. There are several ways to find the adversity data on the website. You can enter it here on the, on the search bar, or you can look through the A through Z index where we have a listing of all of our topics. And usually I go into the data by topic page here. 
on the Data by Topic page, we have the topics organized into eight categories. Uh, and these are all data related to children's health and wellness. For example, we have information about education and child care, emotional, and, uh, emotional health, and physical health. Under the first category, children, uh, child, child and youth safety, we click into it and we find the topic for childhood adversity and resilience. Click into this topic and we see the indicators that are available to measure ch children's adverse experiences from the three sources that I showed you earlier. The first two are the parent reported data from NSCH. The next set is the maternal perspective from the MIHA data. And the final set, when we scroll down, is the adult retrospective from the BRFAS data. Notice that for the two retrospective data sources, we have a compre comprehensive measure, which is this prevalence indicator here, as well as this prevalence indicator up here, as well as the individual measures that make up the comprehensive measure. We also have two comprehensive measures from NSEH, the parent reported data. We have the children with two or more adverse experiences and children who are usually or always resilient. <clears throat> Furthermore, from the maternal retrospective, we have breakouts by family income, maternal age, insurance coverage, and race ethnicity at the California state level. To demonstrate what the data can do for you, we'll look deeper at the parent reported data. So we'll click into this. And here we see that in California, 18% of parents report that their children experience two or more adverse experiences. We can look at the data by county. For example, in Butte County, 24% uh, of the children experience two or more ACE adverse experiences. We can also look at the data by city. So over here on the left, we have all the counties listed. There's a plus mark if we have also city data. We can click into it. And for Butte County, we have data for the city of Chico. So we see over here, 22% of children in Chico have experienced two or more adverse experiences. We can also order the data to quickly see what counties have the highest and lowest percentages of children with adversity by clicking on the percent above it. And this uh, organizes it from high to low. So for example, we see that Santa Clara County, Marin County, San Mateo County have lower percentages of children with two or more adverse experiences. At the bottom, we see that Yuba County, Humboldt County, Shasta County has higher percentages of children with two or more adverse experiences. You may want to visualize the data in a different way. So for this particular indicator, there are uh, two other uh, methods offered. One of them is through MAP. After clicking the, nap, the MAP tab, we have a California map where you can see that the darker shaded areas are areas of, of where higher percentages of children are experiencing two or more uh, adverse experiences and the lighter sh shaded areas are lower percentages. If there's no shading, that means we do not have data for those particular counties. As you hover over the counties, you can get the additional information about uh, that particular county. Another way you can visualize the data is by uh, bars. Click into this. And here I'm going to select just a few. So we have uh, just a little bit, I'll select United States, California. I'll take one county, we'll go with Fresno County this time. And let's take a city, here we have Clovis. So here we see that 23% of uh, children have experienced two or more uh, adverse experiences uh, compared to California with 18% and Fresno County and Clovis falls somewhere in between the two. 
After you have decided what kind of visualization you want for your data, we have multiple ways to download the data to fit your purpose, whether it's for a presentation, an article, a handout, or something else. Up here, you see the download and other tools function. You click this and you see a pop-up box. You can, you can uh, download it into Word or PowerPoint, and I showed you an example of this earlier on the PowerPoint slide. Or you can download it into Excel, and with that you can create your own visualizations. Or you could put it into a PDF. We have pre-selected information already uh, created for PDFs, and you can add your own graphic to the bottom of the PDF that we have created, and then hand that out. Uh, or, down here at the bottom, if you have a website or a blog, you can embed it directly onto uh, your website or blog. And the beauty of this is every time we update the data on our site, it will, will be automatically updated on your site. We also provide important contextual information. And you can get to that information uh, from these links up here, or from this link here, or you can simply scroll to the bottom. For every indicator, there's information about the topic below the graphics. The narratives for this particular topic were written in partnership with the Essentials for Childhood group. I'll click here. Down below the table, we have the definition of what the indicator means. We have the data source for where it came from, and we always include a, a footnote to provide you with additional imp important information that you might want to know about that indicator. So for example, for this one, two or more experiencing two or more adverse experiences, uh, we included the, the actual uh, measures that make up that one comprehensive measure. Below that, we have narratives, which we have written to be able to uh, share more information about the topic. So for example, we have why this, child, why this topic is important, how children are faring, and policy implications, as well as others. Click into them to learn additional information. For example, the one in policy implications is particularly useful for today's webcast. Um, and it's about the importance of raising public awareness about ACEs and their negative lasting effects on children and families. And you can read through more um, later as on your own. There are three other items that I want to point out to you, although there are more, there is definitely more to see that I hope you will discover on your own, or you can follow up with us directly later if you have questions. Coming back to the top. We have the uh, data by region page. If you want to see the adversity data for your particular region, you can go into that tab and go into your county or click in to see additional levels of detail or legislative districts. We don't have all data for every single region, but you can click into it to see what we do have available for that particular region. We also have the data by demographic page. So as, if there's particular information you want to know about a particular demographic group, you can look here. For the adversity indicators, we don't have them located on this page. However, you will be able to find a wealth of other information uh, for any particular group you might be interested in. And third, data in action page. Open this one up here. We love to hear from you. Uh, you can share your, do your story with us and with others about how you have used data to improve children's health and wellness. Um, please do share with us. It's very helpful for us and others to know how data is being used. Thank you to those who are already using kids' data and welcome to those who are new to it. We hope that it helps you to advocate for change. And now I'll turn it back to Marissa. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Lori. Um, next slide. Perfect. So now that we've kind of talked about why child adversity and, and walk through the data, I want to talk to you about how you can use this information to engage and mobilize your community. 
And so I've laid out kind of several key pieces about how you would go about doing this. And so the first piece is to identify the champions and leaders. And, and chances are, if you're listening to the webinar today, you are the champions and leaders in your community that can move the agenda forward in addressing adversity and resiliency. And the next piece is, is to organize your supporters around the issue. And I think, you know, by starting with your existing contacts that might be open and receptive to the issue, you can organize a great support base to help you move forward on your agenda. The next two pieces go hand in hand, and they focus on creating public awareness and holding educational events to create a baseline understanding about ACEs. And then the last piece that in some ways I think is the most important piece about engaging and mobilizing your community focuses on developing specific asks to build institutional and community solutions. So essentially, when you're talking to the health system versus the schools, you're going to talk to them about ACEs differently because they're going to care about different pieces of the traumas associated with ACEs. And so it's important that you tailor your message to that specific audience to be most effective in moving your agenda forward. Uh, next slide, please. And so, you know, how do you go about framing these asks? Um, and so I'm going to talk a little bit about kind of how you frame effective communications messages. And so we've gone through all of this wonderful background on the robust knowledge that we have from ACES science and this wonderful, you know, these three wonderful sources of data that we have up on kids' data. But I'm here to tell you today that, unfortunately, the facts of ACES science are often not enough in communicating why child adversity and resilience matters in your community. And there's several reasons as to why that is, but it's primarily because Values nearly always trump facts, especially when there are differences in opinion. And so when you're talking with someone about the issue, you can't simply argue the facts, you know, throw lots of pieces of information at them to change their minds. And this has to do with this idea of dominant public narrative. So in order to actually impact widespread change, we have to change dominant narratives or the stories that shape how people understand and interpret their world to see what's possible in order to create resilience-based solutions in communities. Next slide, please. So now I'm going to provide a brief overview of the cultural landscape um, that kind of deals with our values and beliefs and the stories that shape our perceptions. And this includes lessons that are learned from our work with the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, Essential for Childhood program. And I do want to mention that the slides and the content are adapted from a recent webinar by Marilyn Metzler and Colleen Yeekel on February 22, 2017. So I want to start with this idea of the dominant worldview. And so the worldview is a set of values, beliefs, and assumptions that shape our view of the world. So it's kind of our inherent stereotypes, our common sense, or things that we take for granted in how we interact with the world. And then there are public narratives. So public narratives are the stories that shape people's conscious perceptions, their understanding, their analysis, and their sense of responsibility and possibility. So a narrative is a story that, when told in different ways, can shift public consciousness and change what people think is possible. So essentially, these narratives are created by people and changed by people, and they're grounded within that worldview, so that set of values and beliefs. Um, and so I'm going to kind of walk through a potential example within that to help you understand the difference you know, between the narrative and the worldview. And so, for example, when you have an individual, and we're talking about the issue of, of child maltreatment, someone might say, oh, well, it's the fault of the parents. So, you know, this has nothing to do with me. It's an individual level issue. And then I would come in and say something like, well, you know, we, we all should care about children and families. And so, um, you know, we have a shared responsibility to kind of help the community address the issue of child maltreatment. And, and that person, because they're within their set of values and beliefs, is going to say, no, it's an individual issue. So 
that's you know for several reasons and and that's because people don't like to have their values and beliefs challenged and in some ways they don't even realize that their values and beliefs are being challenged because that's the world view within they live so when you're thinking about you know how to frame and how to message you have to kind of think about what people believe and then what stories are floating around whether that be through you know just day-to-day -day conversation or through the media even that shape what people perceive so essentially the messages that we are trying to communicate to mobilize action are always understood within a framework that is shaped by the dominant public narratives and the common sense and taken for granted worldviews of our american society and culture um, so, you know, we've, now that we've talked about this notion of dominant worldviews and how they're very powerful and generally override all of the other narratives, um, I kind of want to talk about the dominant worldview surrounding child maltreatment. Next slide, please. And so some of you that work in child maltreatment may be very familiar with the things that I've listed here or have other examples that are not included. So this is just kind of a, a short list of things that we commonly hear in the public when people talk about the issue of child maltreatment. Um, so things that we commonly hear include, child abuse is mainly a problem of the poor and other cultural groups. It's bad parents and children. They're the ones that are to blame. Bad parenting is the reason why child maltreatment is an issue. And then parenting is a family issue. It's not the government or the community's job to intervene. And then the last piece kind of focuses on child welfare and legal systems and that they're not tough enough in addressing the issue. So, you know, if they did a better job, then we wouldn't even have to, to deal with child maltreatment. And so all of these narratives exist out there when we're trying to do our work that focuses on maltreatment and, you know, the adversity piece as a whole. And so instead, what we need to do is create a new public narrative grounded in the values and beliefs that support safe, stable, nurturing relationships and environments for all parents and children. So, you know, kind of as I talked about before, it's this idea that when you ask people if they care about children and families, they're going to say yes. They might think of it more as an individual versus a community level issue. And so the key is to find that set of shared values that helps you move your agenda forward. Um, you know, and proposing a framework that focuses on this shared responsibility and the possibility for proactive solutions. So the key is kind of shifting from that, that individual to that community level perspective. And that's not necessarily an easy thing to do because we live in this world where people kind of believe in American society and culture that you can pull yourself up by your bootstraps. And that, you know, their structural equality exists, you know, there, there's, there weren't any issues. Um, and all of that was resolved by, by civil rights laws and et cetera, et cetera. So I think that, um, I, I just want to reiterate that this, this is complex, but these are the types of things that we have to think about in our messaging efforts. So next slide, please. And so going back to this, this asks piece that I was talking about before, what kind of asks can we be promoting? And there are ways that we can work to change the narrative. And so there are several pieces to that, including working with the alternative narrative values. So, so finding those shared values that I talked about on, on the previous slides. And then to move away from that individual to a community focus and to move from reactive to proactive, so thinking, you know, prevention versus intervention. And then the last piece is to really promote a protective framework that allows us to positively impact these multiple social problems. Um, so kind of when you, when you look up here, you know, you see child abuse, bullying and hazing, youth violence, sexual violence, intimate partner violence, and these are all ACEs that kind of exist in that wide-ranging trauma framework and so we need to kind of move towards those community-based resilient solutions to actually shift the narrative. And so the last piece I kind of want to insinuate before I move on to the next slide, and I did talk about this a little bit, is that this is really complex. This is not easy stuff to do. But if you don't think about the worldview and the narrative, so you know our values and beliefs and the stories that shape those beliefs, when you're framing and messaging and talking about ACEs, 
you're not going to be effective in translating your message to the local community. Next slide, please. So now that I've kind of walked through um, how you would engage and mobilize and, and went through the very basics of thinking about how you frame your message, I want to walk through some examples of how people have actually been doing this. And so I've included a wide variety of examples, including local California examples and some state level examples and an outside California example just to cater to the diversity of participants on today's webinar. Next slide, please. And so I wanted to start with Butte County because I think they've done an incredible job um, raising awareness about the issue of ACEs and then creating resilience and trauma-informed solutions in their community. And so Butte County used the initial BRFIS ACEs findings from a report released by the Center for Youth Wellness called The Hitting Crisis, and they used that to inform their efforts. And so as I talked about before, the ACEs data provided that great frame for them to talk about trauma as a cross-sector and county-level issue. So it was compelling for folks in Butte County to realize that their ACEs number were so high. And it was surprising to some people because they were viewing trauma as these individual issues. And when it was put in the frame of ACEs, they realized, wow, trauma affects everyone across our entire county. You know, ACEs is really that social determinants frame to capture the various types of trauma. And so from there, they were able to educate their county folks by leveraging existing relationships under a low-hanging fruit mentality. So going back to my slide earlier where I talked about engaging and mobilizing community, they started by identifying their champions and then forming a collaborative from there. And then they reached out to their existing contacts or their supporters that they knew would be receptive to learning about the idea of ACEs under this low-hanging fruit mentality. So essentially, they said, who would be willing to listen to ACEs? What relationships do we already have? And how can we use that to create a baseline understanding about ACEs in the community that leads to solutions? And so from my conversations with Butte, I know that they had a general message about the burden of ACEs that they used when talking to different people. But they used a frame depending on who they talked to. So they made sure to target their asks based on the different audiences they were reaching out to. Next slide, please. And so from there, you know, after creating this baseline understanding about ACEs, they were able to implement several county-level trauma-informed solutions. And this is just some of the solutions that they are in the process of implementing. So the school districts adopted ACEs awareness resolutions, the first five commission put ACEs into their strategic plan. ACEs were incorporated into the Butte County Public Health Department community improvement model. And then Butte is in the process of establishing, establishing a trauma 101 training with the champion model, where those champions then go back to their organization and train the workforce about issues surrounding trauma. And so you know, the, the key takeaway that I, I want you to have with Butte County is that you know, sometimes you might not know where to start, but by identifying your champions and organizing your supporters, you are able to, to move this agenda forward. It just kind of starts with who you know. And also that the ACEs data is a great tool to help you frame the different types of trauma. And then also the ACEs data itself is really easy to visualize and to explain to people and really helps you make that translation you know, from, from the data and evidence base to actual solutions that have an impact in your community. Next slide, please. And so the next slide that I'm going to talk about focuses on Lead for Tomorrow Family HUI. So this is our state level example of how people have used the data for planning and implementation efforts. And Lead for Tomorrow is the parent leadership grantee of our partner, the California Department of Social Services, Office of Child Abuse Prevention, for the years 2016 through 2019. And they used our child adversity and resilience data topic on kidsdata.org to determine where to focus their programming efforts and where to allocate their resources. And so from there, they decided to focus on San Joaquin, Imperial, and Calusa counties with the hopes of reaching out to others in the future. So the, you know, the reason why I'm including this example is because 
as I mentioned, there's a diversity of participants listening to the webinar today, and that the data can really be used at all levels to inform your efforts and can supplement other resources that you have in figuring out which communities you want to work with and how you want to build those relationships. Next slide, please. And the last example that I want to talk about is really just an innovative example of how a local community has used an ACES screening tool. And oftentimes when we talk about ACES, particularly at the individual level, we think about screening tools. But kind of how they've used this screening tool to move ACES away from an individual level issue and turned it into a community level priority. And so Baltimore's child death review team became interested in learning about ACEs after they learned that the odds of experiencing a serious injury in young adulthood increased by ACE score. So when they looked at child maltreatment, for example, particularly physical abuse and neglect, they saw that it had a strong influence on the odds of intentional injury. And they had learned this information from a study that used data from the National Longitudinal Study of Adolescent and Adult Health. And so they thought, you know, how, how does this information apply to our work? And so as I mentioned, they created this screening tool that combined the traditional ACEs measures that focus on household and family dysfunction um, that I talked about earlier. And then they combine that with these urban ACEs. So urban ACEs get at that social determinants piece and focus on things like poverty um, and neighborhood violence, for example. And from there, they used this screening tool to help create prevention recommendations that were used to mobilize their community. Next slide, please. And so this is an example of the screening tool that they created. And so on the left, you can see that they have their abuse and neglect and household dysfunction measures that make up that original ACE score. And then they have their urban ACEs below that that include things like neighborhood safety, bullying, witnessing violence, racism, and foster care. And so when they're reviewing the death of a child, they go through and they look at those original ACEs and the urban ACEs for the child. And then if they have access to the information, they go through the ACEs for the caregivers. And so the great thing about this is, is while it's screening at the individual level, by adding these urban ACEs, essentially you're translating social determinants into data collection that can be used to mobilize your community. So it's basically taking an individual level issue and making it a community priority. And from there, you can actually create prevention recommendations that are pertinent in the community that allow you to align your work with partners and really address the things that are you know, creating adversity and trauma and stress for those that live in a community. So I really just wanted to highlight this example, as I mentioned, to make sure I'm catering to people who are outside of California, but also just because it's a really innovative approach to using a screening tool to talk about ACEs as a community, organizational, and population level issue. Um, and so. That's actually all that I have today, and I, I hope that you found this information useful. And I do want to recognize that you know it's not easy to go about educating and, and making changes about ACEs in your community, but there's a lot of value in this work, and, and I want to thank the champions that are listening on the webinar today. Thank you. Olivia, so now we will turn to questions. Uh, we will get to as many questions as we can, but we will provide the answers to all the questions by email later, and we'll send them out along with the PowerPoint slides and make them available on our website. Olivia, can you turn on to the next slide? So while we're discussing questions, our contact information is available here. Uh, please do reach out to us if there's something you would like to discuss further, or if you want to share your examples of using data to improve children's wellness, or your examples of ways in which you have engaged the uh, community and mobilized your community. So contact information is there. And we have, I'll field the first few questions and then I'll turn to Marissa for some additional questions. There's a question about how often is the data updated on kidsdata.org. For most indicators, we update uh, about 
every year. It's on a rolling basis. We're continuously working on the data. So it, it um, but about a year, every year we update it. Uh, some, also the data for the particular indicator I was showing uh, was from 1112. And uh, that's simply a data lag from, um, you know, the survey and the data work, and then we get it posted on our site. We will have the next set of data we hope to post in the fall, so um, which will be a little bit more recent, but there is always some amount of lag in the data that you see. There's another question about um, is the is kidsdata.org California specific? It is California specific, and I wish that every state had a resource like this uh, to be able to have just a one-stop shop for information about kids' health and wellness. However, we do provide information where we can for U.S. as a whole. Unfortunately, we don't have information about um, for specific states. There is also a question for adversity data, is it only for California? On our site, yes, it's only for California. However, there is adversity data um, for other states from other sources. Uh, a good one for the NSCH data, and that is the parent reported data, is to go to cami.org. And I think we have, I'll show you a link to this later on another slide, but it's C-A-H-M-I dot org, C-A-H-M-I, and that stands for Childhood, Child and Adolescent Health Measurement Initiative, and uh, they provide for U.S. as a whole as well as uh, state data. Marissa, there are some questions for you. Uh, first one, what exactly is the difference between adversity and trauma? That is a good question. Um, so the way that we look at it here at the Department of Public Health is that trauma is a form of adversity. So I, I think, to me, I don't necessarily see them as two different issues. When we're talking about the adversity and the ACEs piece, we're really trying to get at this cumulative notion of the buildup of different types of trauma. And yes, trauma is mediated through the individual, but, but ACEs is really a population and community level issue to look at the different types of experiences that people are having in their community. Thank you. And can you give some examples of how you integrate values with ACEs facts? Hmm, that is also an excellent question. Um, so let me think about that for a second. I'll, uh, while you think about that, I'll answer a question about kids data. What is the smallest geographic level? We go down to the school district as the smallest level. Again, we don't have all data at all geographies. It depends on what our data providers are able to provide to us. We do not have for zip code, census blocks, or census tracts. Um, but we do have for the legislative, various legislative districts. Um, state, county, city, and school district. And Marissa? Yep. So I have thought about, you know, one example, and there's lots of different ways that you can do this, but when we're talking about the BRFIS data for California, for example, when we look at, you know, the prevalence of people with at least one ACE, it's more than 60% of Californians that have one ACE. And, you know, particularly when we're talking about the experience of, of children, kind of the way that you integrate those values and beliefs goes back to the central notion that I talked about before, where you, when you're talking to people, you want to get across this notion that, you know, all people care about children and families. And if 60% of our children are, you know, even if it's, you know, adults reflecting on their experiences, if 60% of that population experience these adversities, then doesn't that mean that, you know, we as a society have a responsibility to do something about that? So a lot of times when we're talking about the value piece, it really does depend on who you're talking to. But I think sometimes taking a step back and going to that, that larger fundamental frame where everyone in theory cares about children and families and then figuring out how you're going to focus from there can be a useful place to start. Thank you. And uh, we'll go back to kids' data, collecting data from counties that are missing data, and a similar question about how do you get data from the smaller counties. 
uh, that's a, always an ongoing concern about having um, a wider breadth of data across all the counties, not only for the adversity data, but for some other indicators as well. Because as the geography gets smaller, it's hard to uh, report data and keep it um, reliable. Keep reliable information. So we are always trying to find ways to present more information. For other data that on our site related to adversity, we sometimes do put together some uh, surrounding counties so that we're able to present their data. Also, I do know that some counties in terms of the adversity data have, go have gone through their own efforts to collect data uh, in their local areas. Um, that's just from hearing people, people will mention it to me from now and then, but I know there are some local efforts as well. And Marissa, uh, let's see, how are you working with media to change the public narrative? That is also a great question. And so as a part of our promotion of our work surrounding this new child adversity and resilience topic, we actually have some upcoming trainings where we're partnering with Kids Data and ACES Connection and Berkeley Media Studies Group in California to do several pilot workshops, including one that focuses on um, talking to journalists about ACES, so helping them communicate about these trauma issues and kind of get at that larger community level frame and also focus on positive things like resilience and healing. And so I think that's an ongoing challenge um, in any field in particular because I think, you know, the media focuses on the pieces that they want to focus. But there are several pieces and, you know, several relationships that you can leverage to, to focus on addressing that. And then one other piece I will mention, too, is, is through our work with the CDC, they do have a journalist's guide for talking about child maltreatment. And so, you know, we promote that and we use that in our work when we have any media requests. Thank you. And Marissa, do you have feedback on how to facilitate interagency alignment of ACEs messaging, advocacy, and outreach for collective impact collaboration? collaboratives? For example, do you have templates? We don't have any templates in particular, and I think because that's because a lot of the interagency alignment has to do with relationships. So it's thinking about, you know, starting within your own agency and then thinking about who, who are those ACEs champions and advocates and, and who's already doing this work. Because as I said, a lot of people, even if they're not thinking about it in the notion of ACEs, they're already doing this work. And then it's thinking about, you know, what relationships do you have with other agencies that you can leverage to kind of put together maybe a task force or a collaborative or a network and even just set up an initial meeting to kind of talk about these issues. I think an ongoing challenge for us in particular as we've been partnering with different state agencies and community organizations to do this work is that um, there's a lot of different ways that you can talk about it talk about ACEs and trauma, but there is also research, particularly from Futures Without Violence, that says, you know, here's what people resonate with the most, and here's the type of language that we should be using to talk about it and to not get caught up in the little nuances. And so I think it, it's kind of trying to use that information and then trying not to be duplicative in your work. So if you know that someone else is putting out a message about ACEs, maybe there's a way that you can support them instead of creating your own separate message because then in that case, you know, so many messages, the underlying theme that you want to get across gets lost. So I think that's an excellent question and I think as the world more moves towards being increasingly collaborative and working on these cross-sector issues, we have to be innovative and opportunistic and really focus on the relationships that we have and that our partners have to kind of come up with a key overlapping message. Thank you. And in addition to Baltimore, which stakeholders are leading the effort to adapt ACEs science and efforts for racial equity in health and human services? Do you have a couple of other examples? I don't necessarily have a couple of other examples off of the top of my head. Um, the reason why I highlighted the Baltimore issue is because it's just 
it's really innovative in terms of what they're doing. And a lot of people, when they think about ACEs, they think about individual level screening. And I wanted to kind of highlight that ACEs, the way it's framed in a lot of ways, is, is more of a community level issue, not to diminish the individual piece of the traumas that people experience. Um, but I think, you know, even when I think about the work that we do here within our Department of Public Health, our Office of Health Equity is very interested in the ACEs issue. And I think as we move beyond this original conceptual frame of ACEs as being just this household and family dysfunction piece, we're really talking about larger equity issues that relate to, to health in, in all policies and structures and organizations. So I think, you know, there's several organizations in California that keep that in mind in the work that they do. And, and chances are anyone that's working on ACEs um, at a health and human service level is thinking about those equity pieces. Yes, and I was, the CDC is a great resource that provides a lot of information. The CDC website, um, CAMI, which I mentioned earlier, the C-A-H-M-I, also the, the Children for Youth Wellness, they also have quite a bit of information that might lead you into, um, I mean, they are definitely stakeholders in leading the effort. Um, so those are three that come to the top of my mind as well. And we are next. In a moment here, we'll show a slide with some additional uh, contact information as well. Uh, maybe we have time for one more question. We will um, definitely follow up for all of those that we were not able to get to so that we are, uh, we're able to get answers to you for, for all of the questions. Let's see. To, well, I think this one we answered th during the presentation dur after the question came out, to what degree are we focusing on institutional structures versus individual stories? And um, at the foundation, uh, at the Lucille Packard Foundation, we are definitely interested in the in institutional structures and working with state government or at more local levels in terms of structural change to um, improve children's health and wellness. Individual stories definitely can emphasize certain points that we want to make, uh, but our focus is definitely on institutional structures. Marissa, did you want to add anything to that? Sure. Um, I definitely agree with everything that Lori said. At, at the state, we're very, very interested in the, the structural and organizational level pieces of ACEs and trauma. and. So for example, we're actually working on creating a trauma-informed framework that can be used to help organizations assess structurally how they are trauma-informed. And so, you know, there, there's obviously, as I said, the individual stories piece of ACEs, and, and I don't want to diminish the importance of individual traumas, but ACEs is really much broader than that and provides that great frame to address it at a community and, and even population level issue. And with that, we're about at time. Olivia, can we see the next slide, please? So here we have a few websites uh, for you that you can look at and gather additional information. Um, ACES Connection is also a wealth of information to uh, give you connection to other people who are interested in this science. And Center for Youth Wellness, I mentioned earlier. Um, and I want to thank you for attending today. We will have the slides and the recording available, as well as the question, the answers to the questions that we have received here. We'll send them out to all participant, participants, and we will also make them available on kidsdata.org. We hope that your message to improve children's well-being is disseminated far and wide. Thank you very much.